thank you for coming out, everyone. Um, my book is the, the least exciting, as you can see from the cover. We so can get this out of the way and move on to better things. Um, and I'm unfamiliar with the conventions here, so it will either be spot on or it might be very different from what you used to but, um, Being invited by Oxford University Press to write a book on ethnography, what could I say? My first book, Hip Hop Underground, was an ethnographic study of racial identification and how race mattered in the independent hip hop scene in the San Francisco Bay Area. And as part of that research, I performed alongside aspiring hip hop artists at San Francisco open mics. I went on a 28 city national tour of the US with four hip hop, other, with four hip -hop groups. And I founded a hip hop music group that was described by a longtime Bay Area hip hop aficionado Billy Jam as, quote, in the true spirit of the West Coast indie hip hop tradition, end quote. Um, that group ended up releasing two CDs and two 12-inch singles. One of those singles was the number one record on KCSB Urban Beatbox Top 30 music charts for the week of May 27, 2002. Um, I don't know anybody at KCSB and no one else does, so they liked it. And it wasn't just because they were our friends. Um, <laughs> The distinct and complicated aspects of that research made me by just made me a methodologist. I really didn't have any choice because it was so kind of rich in complexities around that. Around 2012, the sociology department's quali the primary qualitative research methodologist, Carol A. Bailey, retired and essentially willed me her social issues of qualitative methods course. Unquestionably teaching that course was a part of this book's foundation and really in the learning that I have done both preparing to teach but especially from the students who have been in that class. Um, mostly what I do is just get out of the way and the students in the class kind of make the class and I learn from them. Um, in my post-tenure years, I've been able to write about methodology for pieces in collaborative anthropologies for the Journal of Pan-African Studies and most notably, <coughs> Patricia Levy invited me to contribute a piece on the history of ethnography to the Oxford Handbook of Qualitative Inquiry. So when Oxford asked me to write this book on, on understanding qualitative ethnography, um, what could I say? After I cleared my plate of my various commitments to other things that I was doing, um, when I really got down to it, suddenly the, the idea of writing an entire book on ethnography was daunting. What did Oxford expect me to write about? What did they expect me to say about ethnography? Um, Ethnography has become so ubiquitous in qualitative research circles, and it's periodically connected to controversy. I'll just reference one of the more recent ones surrounding Alice Goffman's book on the run about young black men navigating their way around the criminal justice system in West Philadelphia. Um, Oxford specifically asked me to write a book about, quote, how we understand qualitative research, how we write it up, represent it to an audience, and how we as an audience can make sense of it, end quote. And I feel that I, I feel relatively confident that I achieved that. But as I set out to write it, I thought, what can I contribute that hasn't already been said? Um, ultimately, I settled on a few things. I want to talk about a couple of the significant things today. Of course, um, the book discusses ethnography in all the ways that I talk about it and teach it. And, and I talk about it with students in my class. Um, and this has to do with seeing ethnography as uh, something that, in which a, a research methodology in which you not only present research findings, but where you also need to say something about the ethnographer, the human instrument doing the research, and how they came to know what they know. Um, I also was very big on the idea of saying that you must do more than tell in ethnography, you must show. So don't just say this, show, show us how, how something matters. But the turning point for me, really, in terms of writing the book, came when I realized that Oxford University Press had authorized me to be a voice contributing to how ethnography is understood today and beyond. And that in that role, I had the opportunity to not just say what should be said about ethnography, but to assert what I think is important, even if other people aren't saying it as loudly as I am. And from here, we go to my contributions. So one, so what are the distinct contributions of this book? One, I think, emphasizing ethnography as a research tradition within anthropology. 
My PhD is in cultural anthropology. Ethnography has been the hallmark methodology for cultural anthropology since the earliest decades of the discipline's formation. Um, even those Chicago sociologists who embraced ethnography in the 1920s understood themselves to be doing a closer to home version of what anthropologists did. So as I witness the term ethnography being loosely thrown around, and as I consider the controversies associated with the term, I think authorized voices such as mine need to give some clarity to what ethnography is and isn't. I take issue with someone who just learned the term in the last week walking around the library and counting the number of people at each table and saying, I'm doing ethnography. And yes, this does happen. <laughs> as an anthropologist with interest in history, <coughs> including the history of anthropology, I don't think anyone should be claiming that they're doing ethnography if they have not, for instance, heard of Bronislav Malinowski, um, at, at, who, is a, who is the recognized founder of the ethnographic tradition. Now, in saying this, I'm not trying to uphold Malinowski as a hero or to say that he is necessarily deserving of his founder status. But if you're going to claim to be doing ethnography, I think you must know something about its origin. Several years ago, um, I, when I used to perform hip hop in the DC area, I, I was doing a show at a place called the Velvet Lounge on U Street. And I remember it was a packed crowd, filled with people, and I remember I, I told I told a joke that no one in the audience really got it. Was up. I said, "I'm from Blacksburg, Virginia, and you know what?" And one of them was looking at me, "What?" And I said, "I realize y'all have 7-Elevens down here too." <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was a similar, but I remember it was a packed, packed show. Um, the place was crowded. Um, after the show, we went home. Um, I was staying with the promoter of the show, and the venue called us up, and something had been damaged at the venue. Um, apparently, one of the opening, one of the acts, it was kind of this candle wax record showcase, but one of the opening acts saw the packed house and thought they were going to get paid a lot of money. Like, wow, this place is full. We're making thousands of dollars because you get a certain amount of what's what the door takes in. They received, I don't know, probably a couple hundred dollars, and I think he had been drinking and was upset and like banged something and broke something. Um, so the, 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 book, the person who booked for the Velvet Lounge called us up, and the point he made to my friend um, and the main organizer of the show was, I don't want you to see the Velvet Lounge as a place where you do shows. I want you to be part of the Velvet Lounge community. I want you to see this as your home. I say that because when I imagine ethnography, I don't see it simply as a methodology, a method that people are using. If you're just going to use a method and call it something, call it field work, call it participant observation, call it behavioral observation, call it anything else. But if you're going to call it ethnography, understand that you're taking part in and taking part in furthering an important research tradition. So much, of, so much of my book, particularly the first chapters, are rich in detailing the history of ethnography in anthropology and in the early efforts of the Chicago School. A second part, which I'll speak a little bit more that I think is a, is a contribution of my book, is something that I call ethnographic comportment. And just to give the backstory on that, several years ago I was submitting a piece to an article, I was submitting an article on hip hop song making to the Journal of, Amer of the Society of American Music, where a reviewer recommended that I consult Harris Berger's recent book, then recent book, Stance, Ideas About Emotion, Style, Meaning, and the Study of Expressive Culture. In the book, Berger explains Stance as an affective, stylistic, and valuable, and valuable quality which a person, quote, grapples in which a person grapples with a text, performance practice, or item of expressive culture to bring it into lived experience. Stance can be composi compositional, as in writing, or stance can be performative, but it involves a complex relationship between the author-performer and a pre-existing entity often imagined that exists outside of oneself. So um, this compositional stance is deeply implicated in writer's block probably particularly the kind of writer's block that ends up with crumbled papers on the corner because you imagine what that end product should be, but as you're writing and it's not looking that way, you throw it away, but there's something that you're imagining. Um, stance is also implicated in, I used to show a video, two videos in my class simultaneously and they dawned on me at one point. One is called Heavy Metal Parking Lot. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Heavy Metal Parking Lot. In 1986, someone took a video camera to a Judas Priest show um, in, in 
Woodbridge, Virginia, somewhere in Virginia, and they just filmed the parking lot. And at that time, having a video camera was something, and people were actually asking, like, are you MTV, or what's going on? And it's just, a, I mean, it's quite a scene. Parking lots of any space are quite a scene. Um, I used to show that video, and I also showed, this is an old video, too, another old thing from around 2000, called uh, Merchants of Cool. And Merchants of Cool are about the creators and sellers of popular culture. Now, in both those videos, when you watch what young people do in those videos, and you can think about selfies and, and whatever people are doing today and putting on social media. But if you watch, there's a distinct difference. Um, the young people in Heavy Metal Parking Lot in 1986 are very kind of innocent and not really, they don't even know how to put themselves in front of a camera. And you just get this kind of, uh, we're here and maybe some, some of them have been drinking and there, there are different expressions, but you could see this real innocence. The, the people, by 2000, the kids, the young people in heavy metal parking lot had an awareness of what that video camera was shooting and what they were going to look like in that video camera and knew exactly how to perform and dance in front of the video camera and, po and, and pose in ways that looked just like you would see in a, in a music video or, or something like that. This is, when, when I talk about performative stance, this is the distinction that I'm talking about, that awareness of what this end product is going to look like and that, how that awareness of it influences your, your, your performance. So in taking these ideas about stance and these ideas, and Berger also says that stance involves, grapple, that your grappling often looks back and forward across the production process to anticipate and grapple with the to, to anticipate or recover the grappling of others. So there's also an awareness of how is this going, going, going to be seen. So when I think about this, I, I, I think about the two definitions of ethnography. Well, two, um, they're not quite definitions, but two understandings of ethnography. One is ethnography as a research methodology, and the second is ethnography as the written product of research. And in many ways, this notion of comportment, which draws from stance, brings the two together brings this idea of imagining this finished product and how this Im image of the finished product um, conditions how people think about the early project. So given my previous position on ethnographers' exposure to ethnography, um, their methodological training, their awareness of history, and the controversies that surround it, and they're participating in furthering this, and given my position on ethnographers seeing themselves as, again, taking part in furthering this tradition, um, which is often fueled by an what I'll just call an abstract notion of good work. I'm not going to say precisely what good work is, but that I want to do good work. In my book, I introduce this concept of theoretical comportment and explain it as a politics of positionality that centers the body as an instrument of data collection and guides researchers throughout the duration of the research project. I argue that ethnographers' continual awareness of their imagined final product, published ethnography, or what, what they tend to write with this, um, in their desire to perform good work, influences the spontaneous strategizing, strategizing integral to ethnography's iterative, inductive research design. Even the best laid research designs um, inevitably come, come into complications and, and, and you, in the messiness of real life, you encounter things that you had not that researchers had not anticipated. A common trope in many ethnographies involves something coming up that really changes the whole scope and course of the research when it's going on. And often, sometimes, people are suspicious if everything works out too, too perfectly. Thus, there's a tension between research design, which is generally thought of as a series of prescribed steps and procedures through which data is collected, analyzed, and analyzed. And there's a tension between that and the fluidity and unpredictability of doing research within real life context. So I see comportment as, as bringing those two things into, into conversation. Um, comportment is typically defined as behavior, bearing, or a way one carries oneself. And while one's behavior in an as an ethnographic researcher or writer is certainly important, I want to focus on the second two definitions, bearing and how one carries oneself, because I believe they more directly index the body as a vector of knowledge and as a locus for, for <coughs> positioning, sensibilities, and orientations that influence our in-the-moment decisions. So the point I'm making is that throughout ethnography, you're going to be consistently confronted with points where you have to make decisions. I'm in this community right now. Someone just offered me tickets to a performance going on tonight. This wasn't part of my plan. Do I want to go to that performance or do I not want to go to that performance? 
that decision and, and it can be can be um, significant in the thickly described textures that you end up using to make your case when you are writing your ethnographic piece. And throughout this time, we, we are being we're being being confronted by these. So what I, what I'm trying to do, and I'm going to kind of summarize. So I think I've I've gone on for for a good point now. But what what I'm trying to say about putting these two things together, one is comportment, and the other is this understanding ethnography as a history and tradition, is that through training within through what I consider appropriate, if I can use that word, training, within anthropology or other research traditions. People are aware of the controversy surrounding ethnography. They're aware that um, ethnography sometimes, um, and deserving controversy surrounding it, they're aware that in some circles ethnography is questioned as unethical, and some, in some circles ethnography has a bad name. And they understand the positions that they're making throughout the process as contributing to producing a work and a work that they imagine that will help to further um, ethnography as a valued research tradition and will try to represent good work and go against the, the often justified wrongs that have been brought against ethnography in the past. So I really see comportment as a way of putting these two, these two, um, of, of Thinking about research design, but not thinking about research design in a way that you're necessarily always moving forward, but thinking about a way that research design can imagine a future product and put that into and have that influence how we hold ourselves and the stance that we take in making all the spontaneous decisions that we have to make throughout the process of our work. So that is um, what I see as something that's new to this work. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having us, Wayne.